Good afternoon. We're going to get started. Um, so I want to welcome you to this uh, session the, of this afternoon, which will focus on PMTCT. I'm uh, Jeanne Sibud. I'm an obstetrician here in Paris, and I have worked for seven years with the French perinatal cohort, a national multicenter cohort that studies the strategies of PMTCT in France. I will let my co-chair introduce herself. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for staying this late in the conference. Uh, my name is Laura Gay. I'm a research professor at George Washington University in DC and the vice president of research um, at the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. And having done this for 29 years now, I think we've made amazing progress, but we still aren't quite done yet. So we're going to hear about some of the latest uh, results in the field. So. Uh, thank you for coming. So we are delighted to be chairing this session. Um, the, we will focus in the first part on the challenges of uh, taking care of late presenters, and then in the second part of on the develop, development evaluation of PMTCT strategies in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you, we will have some questions, two or three questions after each talk. And then if we have some time at the end, we will try to have also um, some questions at the end. So I will introduce the first speaker. The first speaker is Carlos Brites. You can take your place. Who's a um, professor in infectious diseases at the Federal University of Bahia and senior researcher at the UFBA and Fundação Baiana de Infectiologia. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to discuss with you today the results of this clinical trial on the comparison of uh, haltegravir versus lopinavir for treating late presenters pregnant women. This is my disclosure. Well, we know that uh, the level of maternal viral load at delivery is one of the main predictors of the risk of MTCT. And late presenters usually offer a big challenge because they need potent antiretroviral regimens capable of providing a fast decrease in viral load. And sometimes the time to deliver is very short and they, you have not, no condition to uh, getting this goal easily. In Bahia, where I work in Brazil, about 25% of pregnant women are diagnosed with HIV only after 28 weeks of gestational age. We know also that the haltegravir provides a rapid drop in viral load and seems to be safe in pregnancy. And uh, as far as we could see, there is no published trial comparing haltegravir and other antiretroviral drugs in pregnant women. The main hypothesis of our study was that haltegravir based antiretroviral regimens would be able to suppress HIV viremia in late present pregnant women to undetectable levels at the moment of delivery. And the primary Endpoint of the study was the proportion of patients with HIV RNA viral load below 50 copies at the end of pregnancy and the time to reach a viral load below 50 copies uh, since the, the entry uh, randomization to the study. This is the design of the study. It was an open label, randomized, and single center pilot study to compare the safety and the efficacy of AZT3TC plus haltegravir versus AZT3TC and boosted lopinavir in late presenting pregnant women. They were randomized one to one and we assessed the viral load at week two, four, six and that delivery. All, uh, the primary endpoint, as I said earlier, was a viral load below 50 cops at delivery uh, using the FDA snapshot uh, algorithm. But this study was terminated by a IRB after enrollment of 33 patients due to a significant difference between groups. And uh, the inclusion criteria was a confirmed HIV-1 infection, viral load higher than uh, 1,000 copies per ml, and gestational age higher than 28 weeks, and uh, age of, of the patient's age above, uh, equal above uh, 15 years. And we tried to assess the time to reach a viral load below 50 copies per ml, the proportion of patients with viral load indetectable at delivery, clinical and the laboratory incident, adverse events uh, by group, and MTCT rates. It was assessed through a uh, viral load at babies by real-time PCR at four weeks of age. This is the, the summary of the study procedures. 
we assessed uh, almost 300 uh, pregnant women for eligibility. 243 were excluded due to different reasons, but uh, they did, do not feel the inclusion criteria. 33 were randomized, and 16 in lopinavir arm, and 17 in haltegravir arm. Of note, all participants completed the study. And uh, the groups were very comparable uh, regarding the baseline characteristics. The mean age was 27 years. Most of them, almost all but, uh, but two, were black or mixed. And the uh, mean gestational age was 33 weeks. The median viral load at the, the randomization was about uh, 15,000 copies per ml. Mean CD4 count 510 and uh, equal uh, level of hemoglobin for both groups, 10.7 grams per deciliter. However, the, the results were quite clear, the difference between the two uh, groups of treatment. At week two, only 6% of patients in the lopinavir arm had reached and detectable viral load against 41% in haltegravir arm. At week four, the difference was even higher, 15% in the lopinavir arm against 75% of women with undetectable viral load in haltegravir arm. And that week six, all women in haltegravir were below 50 copies against 20% only in lopinavir arm. And when they look at the, the viral load at delivery, the main, the primary endpoint, we see a basically similar picture. At the group of, uh, in the group of lopinavir, only four but out of 12 patients, 25% were undetectable. In the Altegravir group, 76% had undetectable viral load. And uh, of note, one of these patients arrived at, uh, to the study with almost 150,000 copies. And after three days of treatment, it was decreased to 12,000 copies, uh, uh, three days of uh, Altegravir use only. So uh, the mean time to delivery for, was similar for both groups, Haltegravir and Lopinavir, around 43 days. And uh, regarding mother-to-child transmission, all newborn received Zidovudin for four weeks, according to Brazilian guidelines. In addition, two newborn in Lopinavir arm also received the Nevirapine three doses because the maternal viral load was above 1,000 copies at delivery. And all babies in both uh, groups were tested negative for HIV-1 plasma RNA at week four. Uh, this, this is a summary of adverse events. Although the, most of the adverse, all adverse events were of mild intensity, but there is a clear difference in terms of uh, frequency between groups. You see that uh, in Lopina VR, basically the main uh, adverse event detected were gastrointestinal, diarrhea, and only one-third of patients. However, no discontinuation was uh, detected due to the adverse events, and no severe adverse event was uh, detected in this study. Our conclusive were that Haltegravir was significantly more effective than Lopinavir in providing a viral load below 50 copies at delivery. Haltegravir also promoted a faster decay in viral load in comparison to lopinavir at all time points of the study. Lopinavir was significantly less well tolerated than haltegravir, basically due to gastrointestinal uh, symptoms. And no case of MTCT were detected. And finally, we consider that haltegravir is a safe and effective option to treat late presented HIV positive pregnant women and should be considered as a preferred antiretroviral uh, in such situation. I thank the study participants and Merck and Brazilian National Council for Scientific Development for supporting this study. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We will now be able to take some questions. So you have microphones on the left side, please. Taha, Johns Hopkins University. Could you comment on the baseline viral load? Uh, if I read the numbers correctly, it was 21,000 in the uh, Lepinovir group and uh, 12,000 in the... Uh, yeah, this, uh, uh, I showed the, the median uh, viral load. If you look, look at the intake quartile range, it's much higher, and uh, some patients had above 100,000 copies, in, especially two patients in, in uh, Haltegravir.
Yes, please. I'm Christiana Obra. I'm from Bucharest, Romania. And I have a, um, maybe it's a comment or it's just a, a question for all of you because we, we diagnose a lot of uh, uh, pregnant women in, in late pregnancy, a lot of IV drug users. And sometimes they are in week 32 or 30 or 34. And, and we are uh, dealing with this severe problem and we are starting treatment with four drugs. We use a protease inhibitor and an integrase inhibitor. And after birth, we, we desescalate it. We, we take out one of the drugs because Sometimes it's, it's, I don't know if it's a good attitude, but we had a good results, and I don't know if you have this experience with uh, using more drugs when you are diagnosing uh, uh, bring, uh, um, women in late pregnancy. Do you have any experience? Of uh, we had some individual cases that use more than three drugs in the past, but a few years ago we published a case series with uh, 14 women treated over 20, 24, 25 uh, weeks of gestation now age, and most, all of them using only uh, integrase inhibitor, a third drug, no fourth drug was added, and uh, the results were amazing. And uh, we have some cases, uh, in general, the, the time of use of uh, autogravir for those, those uh, women was uh, 18 days. And uh, the median decay in viral load was above 2.5 logs in this period of time. So, in my opinion, three drugs uh, containing an integrase inhibitor would be enough to... Uh, Even if in very late pregnancy? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Here, my microphone. On yes, thank right. you. I'm Joseph Fokam from Cameroon. Uh, thank you for the talk. And in terms of programmatic implication of performance in sub-Saharan Africa, we believe the two arms seems to be okay because there is no transmission. That's that's one. If I got the, if, I mean, if I got your result well, there is no transmission in both groups. Okay. Then now, do we have an idea on on on, on the cost effectiveness? Maybe we don't know if Hatikavi will be more expensive and maybe less affordable for low-income countries. So that's just the issue I wanted to address. Uh, cost effectiveness is a, a problem in Brazil, of course, and. Uh, the current recommendation of the Brazilian guidelines for this case, the late presenting women, it's you start with on how to and after the end of the pregnancy, the patient can be switched to another less cost uh, regimen. So sometimes it's only a bridge between the, the time of the diagnosis and the, the, the moment of delivery, and uh, you can move to a, a lower cost uh, option after that. But the main reason to use integrase inhibitor in these women because probably it would decrease a lot the, the chance of uh, having an MTCT. And you have obviously you will avoid costs with treating a, a child infected with HIV. We'll have a last question, microphone in the back. Thank you. Uh, this is Cecilia from MSF. Um, more or less in the same line that, that the previous question is, um, now that the lutegravir is going to be the first line recommended by the WHO and keeping in mind the public health approach, how feasible is, uh, because I see your conclusions are quite strong, but from the public health point of view, I wonder whether um, rolutegravir is going to be the option when dalutegravir is going to be the preferred recommended regimen by the WHO, especially for low and middle income countries. Yeah, this is a good point and uh, I agree that uh, probably dalutegravir will take a prominent position in terms of a recommendation, but uh, to date, I guess, there is no information or available information on Dolutegravi used in pregnant women. I saw some posters today that maybe in the near future you're going to have some uh, evidence supporting the use of Dolutegravi, but by now, I guess, uh, the body of evidence we have uh, favor Haltegravi because it was more tested in this specific population. Thank you very much. Thank you for this talk. We will now hear uh, Natawan Tepnarong from Thailand. She just finished her fellowship um, as the pediatric infectious disease specialist in the Faculty of Medicine in Shulalongkorn University, Bangkok. Good afternoon, Chair, Kosha, a lady and gentlemen. 
It's my great honor to present our study from Thailand today. This study is under Princess Somsoli PMTCT Fund. I have no conflict of interest to declare. The mother-to-child transmission rate in Thailand is decreased from 11% to 1.9%. And in 2016, Thailand received validation from the WHO for elimination MTCT. And we target to have MTCT rate below 1% in 2020. And in Thailand, we classify HIV-infected pregnant women into group by risk-based approach. And in high, MTCT risk is about 20% of all HIV-infected pregnant women. And we define by late presenting or high viral load. And the infant who born by this pregnant women will receive combination of ART for six weeks. The transmission rate in this high risk group is about 7.4%. And if we want to decrease the transmission rate to the target, we have to give the intensification regimen for this uh, high risk pregnant women. Then we use lauticavir because lauticavir uh, had a rapidly reduction of viral load. And this study have the primary objective to describe HIV vertical transmission rate in pregnant women who receive lauticavir intensification regimen. And the secondary objective is to describe proportions of pregnant women who achieve viral load below 50 and below 1,000 copies at delivery. This study is prospective cohort, and inclusion criteria were high-risk HIV-infected pregnant women who initiated ART at gestational age at least 32 weeks, or the pregnant women who still on ART, but the plasma HIV RNA is more than, still more than 1,000 copies at gestational age 32 to 38 week, and any, any hospital in Thailand can contact us for this regimen. And we send Dautikavir to the hospital by many logistics. After enrollment, the pregnant women will receive Dautikavir plus heart until delivery. And the plasma HIV RNA was done at the time of enrollment and at the time of delivery. For the infant who born by these pregnant women will receive combination of Cidovudine, Lamivudine, and Nevilapine for six weeks, and HIV DNA PCR was done at birth, one, two, and four months of age. Here is the result of our study. From February 2016 to June 2017, there were 101 pregnant women were in low. The pregnant women will come, uh, come from all parts of Thailand, and the median time to start Lauticavir is two days after enrollment, and median gestational age uh, when the initiating Lauticavir is 34 weeks, and median HIV viral load at the time of enrollment is about 3.9 log copies. And about two-thirds of pregnant women initiated on ART at gestational age, more than 32 weeks, and about one-third had high viral load. Among 101 HIV-infected pregnant women in our study, there were 71 pregnant women and 73 infants with two sets of twins was had the available of HIV DNA PCR of the infant available to evaluate HIV status of the infants. And about 68 and 34 infants had the HIV DNA PCR available uh, result at two months and four months of age, respectively. After this, start, after this slide, we will um, de describe the result of 71 pregnant women and 73 infants who had the 
result to evaluate infant status. And here is the, this picture show the plasma HIV RNA of pregnant women at the time of enrollment and at the time of delivery. And at the time, at low, at, at the time of enrollment, you can see that about 75% of pregnant women had viral load, more than 1,000 copies. And at the time of delivery, you can see that the pregnant women had viral load below 1,000 copies per ml is about 78%. There were 43% of pregnant women delivered by cesarean section. And among 73 infants, there were 16% low birth weight and 11% preterm, and no congenital anomaly was found. This slide shows the HIV status of the infants. There were two infants had HIV infection, with one perinatal infection and one in utero infection. The, the transmission rate is about 2.7%. And about 60% of infants had definitely uninfected, and 30% had presumptive uninfected and about 7% had pos possible uninfected. In possible uninfected, we include one infant who died at home on day seven of life. He was born full term and no complication after birth. And we know that he, he was died because we t um, call for the, the HIV DNA PCR test. And we, we just know that they uh, he not go to the hospital. The maternal plasma HIV RNA at delivery just only 192 copies. For compare with the previous systemic review of the plat of the pregnant women who received plauticovir, about 278 cases during 2001 to 2015. Uh, the HIV transmission rate in our study look higher more than that study. And we see that the Sicilian section in our study is lower than the previous study. And if we focus on only the pregnant women who receive plauticovir after gestational age 38 weeks in that study, the HIV transmission rate in high risk group in our study is a little bit higher than that study. It's maybe from the duration of lauticavir in our study is shorter. And the proportion of pregnant women who had the viral load suppressed in our study is lower than that. For the effect of lauticavir to prevent HIV vertical transmission, we can see that the uh, pregnant with about 78% of pregnant women in our study has plasma HIV RNA below 1,000 copies. And there were the previous study of transplacental transfer to prevent neonatal infection during the first week of life. For estimates drug cost of lauticavir strategy, from our study reduction for uh, the risk of transmission from 7.4 to 2.7 percent, we have to prescribe uh, the lauticavir intensification regimen for, the, for 21 pregnant women, costing about 5,000 US dollar to prevent one baby from HIV infection. For this cost, the duct should be reduced in the large-scale national program. For the strength of this study, this study is the pilot program in real life, clinical setting and practical approach, because we use many logistics to, to provide lauticavir to any hospital in Thailand. And we start lauticavir without waiting for uh, viral load result, because it takes a long time to get the result. And we document HIV viral load decay. For the limitation, there were 
about 14% of the infants lost to follow-up before four months of age. But this rate is not unexpected. And the barrier for to implement this strategy due to Lauticavir is twice daily dosing and high cost. And we have to decrease the cost when we use to the last scale. For conclusion, HIV vertical transmission rate is reduced to 2.7% among high-risk HIV-infected pregnant women. The pregnant women who receive Lauticavir intensification ART after GA32 weeks achieve HIV viral load suppression below, before delivery. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now have time for some questions. And as people go to the mic, I have one question. Um, could you just tell me in your flow chart between your 101 pregnancy and then the 71 deliveries, what was the gap in between? Is it women that haven't delivered yet or was it pregnancy outcomes others? Okay. Um, the, there were just the, the out of the pregnant women from the 101, they did not deliver, or some will have just pending the HIV DNA PCR result at mm -hmm. birth, then we cannot uh, evaluate the HIV status of the infants. Thank you. Um, we have one question here in the back, the mic. Again, no, right. Cecilia from MSF. I, I have two questions. The first one is um, your previous transmission rate of seven point something with a very strong ART regimen. Have you analyzed the reasons behind that? Because that seems to be much higher than what has been published with such a regimen. Um, and the second question is, um, how did you manage to do triple prophylaxis to kids? Um, because so far there is, there is nothing available apart from syrups. So I'm quite curious to know how did you perform the triple prophylaxis with ACT, 3TC, Navirapine to those babies? For the, the first question that you mentioned that the rate of transmission, it's just 7.4%, it's just only in high MTCT risk pregnant women, and this group is just only 20% of all pregnant women in Thailand. But in the standard list is 80% of all pregnant women in Thailand. And transmission rate in this group just only 0.5%. And overall, the rate of transmission will that show below than uh, 2% in the first slide. And the second question of the post-exposure prophylaxis for the infant. It is the document in Thai PMTCT program guideline that we use um, combination of ACT, Lamivudine, and Nevilapine to all infants who was born by high-risk HIV pregnant women. Sorry, the, the question is, uh, she was asking, how do you deliver that? So for neonates with three drugs, do you give them three syrups? Or uh, what, what's the formulation for how you give that to the babies? We use the syrup. Syrup, so three yes. syrups they go with. Yes. OK, thank you very much. Yeah. We're going to switch uh, gears a little bit. and. Uh, move to Africa. The first presentation uh, on spatial temporal trends in mother-to-child transmission in Western Kenya will be presented by Anthony Wariru. He is a surveillance epidemiologist working with the CDC in Kenya as a scientific advisor to the National AIDS and STD program, the Ministry of Health, and other CDC partners on HIV surveillance, providing technical guidance for epidemiology, surveillance, and surveys. Anthony, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> On behalf of my colleagues, I'm going to present this work uh, that we did in uh, Western Kenya, uh, looking at uh, spatial temporal uh, trend of uh, MTCT uh, for the years 2007 to 2013. 
I have no conflict of interest to declare. Uh, as a way of background, uh, we know that elimination of uh, MTCT uh, can be achieved through uh, efforts uh, around programming of uh, PMTCT. And uh, that PMTC services are often prioritized uh, by geographic regions, uh, usually district uh, for planning purposes. Uh, EAD is a strategy for identifying HIV uh, status of infants and therefore can be used for assessing the impact of PMTCT. Uh, measuring of uh, EMTCT progress can be done through the following. Uh, you can measure proportion of infected infants and uh, the target is uh, less than 5%. And you can also measure the case rates uh, per 100,000 births and the target is uh, less than 50. And uh, therefore, uh, in this analysis, we are going to um, suggest that putting these measures in a special context uh, may be important. Our aims, uh, we were to assess district level trends and factors associated with the MTCT and also model uh, the rates over time and space. So in our methods, uh, you see from the map on your left, uh, the map of Kenya and uh, the area that is uh, circled with the red circle uh, square is where we focused uh, our analysis in. And that happens to be one of the areas that has the highest uh, prevalence in Kenya. Uh, I also mentioned districts and we had 12 districts, as you can see on, the, on your right. So uh, DBS samples are collected, accompanied by a submission form and sent to a regional lab. HIV testing was performed using PCR and analysis we did uh, of this data uh, using STATA uh, to look at trends. We also used R to uh, estimate uh, the rates and used uh, QGIS to map the fitted MTCT rates. We had 102,000 uh, infants and children. Uh, some of them had missing age and also we had some that were over one year old, which we excluded in this analysis, and we had uh, 95,000 remaining. Results. Uh, we looked at the raw uh, rates, uh, as you can see, uh, using the, um, the, the, the line, the trend line. So you can see uh, rates dropping from 17% to 7.2%. And also we can look at uh, percent tested by eight weeks, uh, which increased from 44% to 64%. We also did uh, logistic regression and uh, looked at a couple of factors, covariates, uh, including year of diagnosis, sex, infant's age, age of diagnosis, maternal regimen, whether the mother breastfed or, breastfed or not, and mother ARV status. And uh, in the multivariable uh, model, uh, we had two of these uh, remaining as significant, uh, and that was age at diagnosis, uh, using a reference of under uh, or equal to two, eight weeks, uh, compared to over eight weeks. So the odds were higher for those uh, who came for diagnosis at uh, eight weeks and above. Uh, similarly, uh, using a reference of ART for treatment, you can see maternal regimen, single dose nevirapine uh, only, uh, we had uh, twice the, the odds. So before we did the, the spatial um, mapping, uh, we ran five models. Uh, one was a generous linear model, uh, which was non-spatial. We also ran a second model, which was spatial model without covariates. Uh, that model was spatial temporal model uh, without covariates. Uh, fourth model was spatial non-temporal model with covariates. And the fifth model finally was a spatial temporal model with covariates. Uh, to assess the model, we used uh, what we call the deviance information criterion. 
so the higher the uh, deviance information criterion, that means the model is weaker. And therefore, we can conclude from this uh, comparison that the spatial temporal model with covariates uh, was the best in explaining MTC rates over time and space. Uh, we also mapped uh, these fitted rates. And you can see from uh, 2007 to 2013, uh, for all the districts we had declining uh, MTCT. Uh, however, none of the districts had uh, MTC rate of less than 5%. Uh, we also looked at the case rates per 100,000 births. Uh, and you can see we are at, overall we, are, we were at uh, 447 uh, cases per 100 uh, buds, uh, but this varied across uh, the districts, as you can see, uh, with the best performing district being one of the uh, districts that has uh, low prevalence, uh, even in the general population. So summary of findings, uh, early testing rate has improved over time, uh, significant drop in mother child transmission over the seven years period, uh, and that case rate per 100,000 live buds is still high. Also, we, we, from the findings, we, we can see that spatial temporal model with covariates was best in explaining MTCT geographical variation. So in conclusion, uh, we're asking ourselves whether spatial temporal modeling uh, helps us to tell a story uh, of these rates. Uh, one, we recognize that we had limitations in the data. Uh, routine data from programs are often incomplete, uh, as we are aware. Uh, and we did not take into account in that modeling uh, the underlying population. Uh, strengths for this modeling uh, may be better than other models, as you have seen, uh, and may offer a visual tool, uh, which is powerful for uh, program planners to focus efforts in uh, certain regions. So are we there yet? Uh, improvement in uptake of infant testing and reduction of uh, MTCT rates uh, may imply growth of the program over time. And overall, uh, the program coverage has contributed to reduction in uh, uh, MTC rates in Western Kenya. Geographical disparities uh, still signify gaps uh, in distribution of these efforts. Uh, and we are recommending that more spatial and spatial temporal analysis should be considered as additional tools for planning. Uh, recognizing also that this data was uh, pre-option uh, B+. Plus. So we I acknowledge the following, uh, MOH, uh, Kenya Medical Research Institute, uh, CDC, and University of Washington, University of Nairobi uh, for training in GIS. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any Questions in the audience? Uh, thank you for the presentation. I wanted to ask you, when were the babies tested? And if it is possible that some babies actually were not tested? The second part of your question, thank you for your question. The second part of your question is, uh, uh, it's possible that some babies are not tested because it's not you know, like entire coverage of the whole region. Uh, however, uh, the confidence we have in the data is because we have only one regional lab in that area. So whatever AED, uh, EID was happening uh, in that region, uh, all data went to one lab. Uh, then this, uh, the first part of your question, uh, the, uh, this was the first test uh, for that particular infant. Which is after birth? After at, birth. At six weeks? At six weeks and beyond. Okay, so... Um, the reason why I'm asking is that um, you are saying that you have 7% of transmission over all birds, and that is probably not true because many babies are never tested. Uh, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm um, Barbara Castelnuo from Uganda, and we have, even in Uganda, we have a, a big number of babies that are never brought back even for the first test. So you may have a big group where you can't really estimate if there has been transmission or not. Yes, thank you again. Other questions? 
I have a, a question. Um, in terms of looking, uh, similarly, I think you might have answered it, that, that you sorted out those that were first test only, so you weren't counting twice those were confirmatory. Right. And then my other question is, I know that's a high prevalence area. Do they overlap in the prevalence rates with the, with the women? Do you, if you map the prevalence rates, do you see the same pattern in terms of the, where the infections are coming from? We have not considered that, but that's a very good point. Uh, we should do that. Any other questions? Nope. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Our next presentation, the Caspian uh, Chiraya. Uh, Dr. Chiraya is a uh, technical director of the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation uh, office in Swaziland with more than 15 years of experience in programming, implementation, and research. Dr. Chiraya. Thank you. Um, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad to be here and uh, make this presentation on behalf of the study team, which is listed here. I'm also very happy to be the last presenter. <laughs> I, I realize my co-presenters have been very efficient with time. They've given me five extra minutes, and I intend to utilize them. Um, <laughs> Like I said, I feel honored to make this presentation on behalf of this uh, study team that's made of uh, members from the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation, Swaziland Minister of Health, University of California, San Francisco, and also USAID uh, Swaziland. Uh, I have no conflicts to declare except to say one of the co-chairs of this uh, session. I happen to be part of the study team members as, as well. Uh, for those who are not um, aware, Swaziland is a very small country in southern Africa with a population of 1.3 million. Uh, it's the country that made uh, news uh, two days ago with uh, very impressive results from uh, a fear that showed uh, very good progress towards um, uh, reaching the 1990 uh, targets and also reducing HIV incidence. Despite, despite that uh, progress, we still have a very high burden of HIV in Swaziland with a prevalence of uh, 27%, the highest, um, um, I think, in the world. And these data have been um, um, updated with the FIA survey results from two days ago. And our incidence remains very high at 1.4%. Uh, Swaziland is divided into four regions uh, with a total of 52 constituen constituencies, which are administrative um, uh, areas. Uh, as we all know, mother-to-child transmission remains a global challenge. Uh, and there is a move towards eliminating or virtually eliminating mother-to-child transmission by several uh, organizations, including UNAIDS. And uh, WHO has also developed a criteria for uh, validation of uh, elimination of mother-to-child transmission. And uh, WHO, again, recommends several methods that can be used to measure mother-to-child transmission rates, and these include uh, facility-based surveys and also community-based uh, surveys. We went for a community-based survey because of our high uh, rates of uh, loss to follow up in care for children in, uh, in, in facilities. The main objective of our survey was to dis determine the outcome, the following outcomes for HIV exposed infants in the uh, option A, uh, PMTC to option A period. Uh, we were determining HIV free survival, which is the proportion of uh, HIV exposed um, uh, children who were still alive and free of HIV, and also the proportion of uh, children were HIV exposed and uh, infected which is the mother-to-child transmission rate. And we also try to explore factors associated with um, the HIV-free survival. This was a community survey, as we've uh, indicated. Uh, we used a multi-stage sampling procedure to obtain a representative sample of HIV-infected mothers uh, across all the four regions in, in Swaziland. Uh, from the regions, we then selected constituencies. As I indicated, we have a total of 52 constituencies in the, in the country. We uh, stratified them um, uh, into urban and rural and then further into low volume or high volume uh, uh, based on their population, high volume uh, with a population of 15,000 people or, or more. Um, uh, for the urban um, uh, constituencies, we, however, did not have any that fell under the low volume um, uh, criteria. All of them were high volume. We then selected um, um, uh, uh, a total of 12 constituencies, one from each of the strata uh, in each region as uh, indicated. And then we, from the constituencies, we then selected enumeration areas um, uh, and surveyed all households that had a birth between uh, 1st April uh, uh, to October 30, 2013, irregardless of whether the child was currently alive 
or, or not. This is a schema of uh, how the uh, survey was conducted. As I indicated, we, we selected the EAs, went to the households, confirmed if there was a child uh, born 18 to 24 months prior to our survey, whether the child was dead or alive. If there was no child available, we would exit the, the household. But if there was a child available, uh, if there was a child who was born in the past um, 18 to 24 months, we would then further inquire if the mother was available. If the mother was not available, we'll still go ahead and uh, administer our questionnaire and also do a test for the, for the child. And then if the mother was available, we would ask for documents documented result, uh, posit HIV positive results. If they were not available, we'll test uh, the, the woman, or if she was negative, uh, we'll still test all these women. And then those that would test positive, we administered a questionnaire and also tested their, uh, their children. For those that had a documented HIV positive result, we went ahead and administered our questionnaire and also tested the, the child. Now to our findings. Um, uh, we had about 2,000 households that were eligible, um, and 97% uh, of them agreed to participate. Uh, we had uh, 300 um, uh, non-maternal caregivers, and um, uh, the rest were biological um, um, uh, mothers. Uh, in overall, we, we had a total of 28 children that were infected, and uh, four that, uh, that died. Uh, three of the infected children came from the um, uh, group of uh, non-maternal caregivers, um, uh, and the remainder came from uh, uh, biological mothers. We, however, had two infected children uh, who came from the non-maternal caregivers, but unfortunately the mother's um, our status could not be verified, so we did not know the status of these children. In our analysis of the final outcomes, we focused on these two groups. Um, are these children from the non-maternal caregivers were confirmed to be infected or dead, and also this group of uh, children from the biological mothers were confirmed to be infected or dead. We excluded this because we're not sure how many of these um, are women, 115, were actually uh, infected. We know for sure that the two children uh, were infected, um, came from two mothers that were infected, but we're not sure who else was infected in that group. So we felt it might introduce bias in our study analysis. In terms of the characteristics of the HIV-positive mothers, uh, which is our focus, mean age was about 29 um, um, uh, years. Um, uh, uh, facility um, attendance was nine, almost 100% uh, uh, with the uh, mean uh, first gestational age of about 16 weeks. Uh, uh, viral load at baseline, which was at entry in ANC, was about 500. Uh, most of the uh, HIV-positive mothers, about 92% of them, received um, ARVs. Um, I just wanted to indicate that of the women that were total positive, we also had 35 that were newly um, are diagnosed. Uh, so when we went to the survey, uh, the women were either negative from previous tests or were never tested um, uh, before. And then when we had, uh, tested them again, we found that they were uh, HIV um, are positive. Uh, about 90% of these women delivered in a, in, a, in a health facility, and about 8% of them were still breastfeeding their children by the time we're doing the survey. These are our main outcomes. Our HIV-free survival uh, was uh, about 96%, and then the mother-to-child transmission rate was 3.6%. Um, we calculated it. As, as you can see, we excluded the two children that were infected um, uh, uh, from the mothers of uh, unknown status. Uh, when, we, if we, when we assumed the, that the four children that died were uh, HIV-infected, the mother-to-child transmission rate rose to 4.1%. All the four children that died, uh, we were not able to ascertain their HIV um, status. So in this calculation, we excluded them. But in this calculation, if we assume they were infected, our transmission rates goes up to 4.1%. And then in terms of the factors that were associated with HIV-free survival, uh, we had three factors. Uh, from the multivariate analysis that we did that were associated with uh, um, uh, HIV-free survival, and that was age, uh, receipt of uh, ARVs, and also uh, a delivery in a, in a health facility. Uh, the other factors like education, marital status, gestational age at first ANC visit, breastfeeding duration, uh, were not uh, associated with HIV-free survival. 
Uh, our main limitation is um, uh, the, we think we might have captured fewer uh, dead children uh, than we, we reported here. And this might be due to uh, maybe poor identification of those households where uh, children had died. Uh, some families are not comfortable with talking uh, on talking about their dead children. So it's uh, possible we might have missed some households with um, uh, children um, um, are dead. Uh, so there is a likelihood that we might have underestimated the mortality rates and therefore overestimated our HIV-free uh, survival rates for, for this study. In conclusion, uh, this is the first community survey that we've done in Swaziland to show the effectiveness of uh, PMTCT under option A. Um, and our findings in, uh, indicate, again, a very effective PMTCT program in Swaziland with high HIV-free survival and a very low uh, mother-to-child transmission rate at 18 to 24 months. Uh, and uh, Swaziland uh, started rolling out option B+, late 2014. We are going to use these uh, results as a baseline for us to... Um, uh, for us to uh, uh, measure the effectiveness again of option uh, B plus. And in those subsequent uh, surveys, we'll do our level best to try and identify all households with uh, childbirth. Uh, I want to acknowledge all the study participants, the Minister of Health, our donor USAID, um, and everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, questions for uh, Dr. Charaya from the audience? Um, I have one question. Uh, you said, uh, it, it's a, thank you for this very interesting study. You said that breastfeeding was not associated with HIV-free uh, survival. Do you have the information of the duration of breastfeeding in these women or not? Yes, we, we do. Um, our mean duration for breastfeeding was about 15 months. Yeah. Front. Hello, uh, I'm Dr. Oksana Turkan from Eastern Europe, and uh, my question is related to the immunization of these children. I know that uh, Swaziland is a high endemic um, region in uh, country in tuberculosis. So do you know uh, if these children were vaccinated and when? Yes, we collected those, uh, those data, but uh, I was not able to present them here. I can, however, confirm that our immunization rates for Swaziland were, were very, uh, very, uh, very high. Uh, we do have coverages of over 85%, uh, like for the nine-month measles uh, vaccination. Hello. Thank you for your job well done. Uh, I'm Jane from Uganda. I was just, you say that the delivery in the health facility, I think, was 89.4 percent. I was just wondering how you managed to do that. I think in Uganda we are at 54 point something. And then you say that same factor was survival was associated with <laughs> delivery in a health facility. Could it be because almost all are delivered at the health facility? Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, our facility uh, health delivery rates are very high in Swaziland. There's been a lot of efforts that have been put to ensure women uh, deliver in facilities, including um, uh, education, sensitization, uh, availing um, um, uh, 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 maternity services uh, closer to where the women um, are going to be. And uh, like I presented, yes, um, uh, delivering in a in a health facility was actually protective of um, uh, delivery, and this was controlling uh, of uh, HIV survive, free survival, and this was controlling for all the other factors that I've mentioned. In the front here. Marcel Yotibio in the Ohio State University. <laughs> uh, congratulations for a, a very good study. I have two questions that may be mostly technical and how to use the, 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 the approach you have used, the community survey in combination with the routine data that is collected in clinic. I know ECPAF is probably involved in collecting those data to triangulate to see how well that data correlate with the, 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 the HIV-free survivor you have in clinic because country cannot afford to do those things at the, even if they can afford, they cannot do it on a very regular basis that we need to get data in real time to inform program. The second question is how is this transmission, since you, uh, Swaziland have an MPR as well, have you looked at it and see it tri triangulate again to see how we can use those data to quickly get information without spending a lot of time and resources to get. We can use it to enhance the data we already collect routinely to, 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 to be able to use those data to make information or make decisions without having to wait for all of those data. 
Thank you. Um, I do agree with you. These surveys, community surveys, are very um, expensive. But the main reason we had to go for a community survey versus uh, a facility routinely collected data is because, as I mentioned, of our high loss to follow up rates uh, for, for children. By the time we get to 18, 24 months, we do have less than 15% of our children currently in the, in the facility. So that's the reason we had to go for this uh, community um, a survey. We, we're still looking at our um, AFIA results. Uh, as you know, they were just uh, presented two days ago. So we should be able to also triangulate and see if there are any other. Um, um, uh, if there's any other data that we can use for, for, for this. Um, there are several other, um, um, uh, 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 there's several other data that we can use to triangulate as well. We're looking at our spectrum, our UNH spectrum uh, results as well. But as you know, these are models and uh, estimates as well. And from what we've seen, our findings are fairly similar to what spectrum is presented for us. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and, <laughs> and thank all the speakers for sticking to time. So we actually do have the planned uh, about 15 minutes left for uh, additional questions. If any um, further presentations brought up questions for the early ones, if anybody has a question for any of the panel members, um, please come up and uh, ask your question. So it's open to uh, any of the presenters. Uh, I want to, to, to uh, I'm Christiana Obra from Romania. For me, it's still not clear why do we have to then to intensificate the treatment in late pregnancy after 30, if we diagnose a woman at 32 weeks, if the previous uh, speaker said that if we use only raltegravir, it's enough. So we will be, it will be fine. So why should we use then another drug to intensify, intensify, and why don't use only raltegravir? So, so it... Um, because in Thailand, we just be the resort-limited country, and raltegravir is high cost for Thai people or Thai government. And then we use just only intensification for late presenting with the four duct regimen and after birth we can stop lauticavir and yes. and we just use three active drug for treat pregnant women. Ah, okay, so you use it only during this during three four weeks and yes. then you, you stop raltegravir. Okay. I think one, one thing that's important is these studies were going on at the same time. So uh, in terms of countries making a decision about which direction and not knowing which was the correct way, it gives us the opportunity to look at the results in both settings and then see how they compare to make a decision. So previously we didn't have the evidence in order to make a decision. So now there's more data out there that will help inform programs on whether you need four drugs or, or three drugs. Carlos, I don't know if you had anything to add. Uh, I believe that uh, the existing uh, data is, is strong enough to recommend that uh, the use of integrase inhibitor as a good strategy to achieve a decrease or fast decrease in viral load in late presenting pregnant women. I believe any member of the class would be active. And uh, however, as I said earlier, the, we have much more experience, much more available data on how Tegravir, although this is the, the first comparative data, but we have some uh, case series that we have uh, good data from uh, concentration of the drug in, 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 in placenta, in, in baby, and uh, probably it would be a good uh, option in providing a fast uh, decay of viral load in this specific population. No questions? <laughs> Okay, then um, I'd like to thank you all again for uh, staying to the end in your participation. I think we've seen a wide variety of topics, but clearly um, indicating that we haven't, uh, all the 
final answers yet to get to elimination. And so there are many different directions uh, that we need to look at. So I appreciate your, your time, and I hope that we'll all be answering the rest of the questions uh, so we get more data the next time. So thank you very much, and safe journey home. Thank you.